Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this meeting. Um, I want to start my talk by um, proposing a thought experiment for everyone in the room. Think about how would you study evolution if all the creatures were similar in the way they looked, similar in the way they were formed, and had you had no fossil record of any other species that had come before. This is a very complicated challenge. And so in that regard, I'm I want to talk to you today about protein evolution. My talk at the origin of folded protein structures is going to delve into how we study protein evolution and specifically my project, which is um, how do we approach uh, studying specific protein architectures to find the origin of folding in protein structures. So first, uh, a little bit more about protein evolution. Some background for people that don't know, because uh, I know we have uh, people from all fields of science today. So what is a protein? You can think of a protein as an engineered organic machine that performs important functions for life. In reality, they are chains of amino acids that fold in very particular ways. For the purpose of this talk, you can think of proteins as origami. <laughs> You have a paper that has in written in itself the instructions of how to fold itself. But we humans don't know how to read that yet. However, the paper knows how to read it and it folds itself, it collapses into a specific form that has different functions. It can be an airplane, it can be a boat, it can be a, a bird, all these different things. And of course, uh, some folds are common, right? If you want to fold a boat or if you want to fold a airplane, you need to start by folding in the middle. And so you know that there are many origamis that have that uh, starting fold as a common fold. So some folds are more important than others. Um, so what's the problem with protein evolution? With, uh, with sorting, uh, studying uh, the normal animal kingdom or the normal uh, life um, organization system taxonomy. You can see that species have stuff in common because you can see them. They are tangible. You can study them. You can measure them. You can analyze them, right? But in proteins, it's all origami. <laughs> everything looks the same. Everything is made of the same material and everything is just uh, folded molecules. And they are not visible to the naked eye. So it becomes very difficult to establish meaningful relationships between different pieces of paper because they are all look the same and, ha and are folded in similar ways. So in order to approach this problem, people have done a lot of different organization of, pro of proteins. And I'm going to introduce to you specifically a one architecture of proteins. So uh, the most common way of organizing them is by or, uh, just alpha proteins, beta proteins, alpha plus beta, and alpha slash beta. This refers to the combination of alpha helices and beta strands that compose uh, said proteins. The alpha slash beta are specifically interesting because they are more stable and functionally diverse than the rest of the classes, and they're highly connected in protein space. What does, it, what does this mean? This means that if you were to take um, all the proteins that we know of and map them into a Euclidean geometric space and try to cluster them and organize them, right? you would see that the class of alpha slash beta proteins is very, uh, is very continuous. right? It does not have separate clusters. It instead, it's just like a whole continuous network. right? In this way, it is very um, modular, as in its its components can be mixed and matched so that you have uh, a, a range, a continuous range of different uh, similar proteins. And because of this, the alpha slash beta class is thought to be amongst the most ancient protein domains. So this is one approach to studying protein evolution. Specifically, in the alpha slash beta class, we have something called a beta-alpha-beta beta motif. What is this? This is a mix of alpha and beta in a very particular uh, structure or motif, or if you think back to the origami metaphor, it's a, it's a, a fold, 
right? It's like folding your paper in the middle in the same way you have a very specific protein fold that has special enzyme chemistry, specifically with phosphate, which makes it very interesting because life uses phosphate for all different types of, of chemistries from uh, ATP to DNA, right? So uh, because of this, there is evidence that the whole alpha slash beta class that is very important for protein evolution actually started as just this segment, the beta alpha beta fold. So in this sense, beta alpha beta can be think of as a seed for early protein evolutionary process. However, there is a need for mapping in more detail the beta alpha beta space. So if you think back to the concept of what protein space is, mapping all the proteins, right? It looks very continuous. So we need more detail exactly into this region of the map that just represents this very important key evolutionary seed segment. So this is what the project uh, tried to accomplish. So how do we do it? We use something called a TM alignment. And so basically the idea is you would find all proteins that are associated with an evolutionary lineage. So all proteins that people uh, before us have classified into being part of the same evolutionary group. You can think, uh, like if you think about animals, right? This will be all the, the mammals or all the vertebrates and all the invertebrates, right? Like groups that we know are evolutionary related, but in terms of molecules. And then you would, uh, so you would find all of them and you would extract the beta alpha beta fragments that were present in these proteins. Then when you have a whole database of beta alpha betas, you would apply the TM alignment to a pairwise comparison. So you would take one and compare it to all the others and then the next one and so on. And then if the alignment is really good, you would get a high score. In this case, it's a fictional example because they're the same protein. So the alignment would be one. Here are some real examples from uh, my analysis of the different beta alpha betas. So in the left, from left to right, you can see different ranges of scores and how that alignment looks. You can see that less than 0 0.1, a very bad alignment, gives you just like a mess of spaghetti. And on the right, a very good alignment, uh, everything from the alpha helix, but also the loop and the beta sheets uh, align with one another. Now, what you see here is a distribution of all the TM scores, so the scores for all the alignments, that I perform for pairwise distribution. Now, usually uh, a 0 0.5 onwards, it's a good statistic indication of a, that these two proteins represent the same fold, or that these two papers have been folded in the same way. However, because we wanted to be super rigorous, we only took scores that were uh, higher than 0 0.8. So this represented a very, very, very statistical, statistically significant association in the two uh, proteins. And what were the results? Well, this is how the network looks like. <laughs> this is the beta alpha beta protein space. Now, I know this is a lot, but I want you to focus on the colors. The colors are evolutionary lineages that we previously thought were disconnected, right? It's like we thought it was mammals and the others were like, um, I don't know, um, reptiles or something. But here you can see clearly that the colors mix and match and are connected by very strong fold associations. This gives us a very, um, it, 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 it supports the idea that this beta alpha beta are seed segments that eventually grew into all these different evolutionary lineages and, and served as a keystone in, um, in protein evolution. This is a simplified version of the last graph. Each dot here is one of the evolutionary lineages. So one of the colors here, each color is represented here in one dot. And you can see the lines represent BAPs that uh, beta alpha beta proteins that connect evolutionary lineages. And you can see the ones that have the strongest connections. Here's another version of the previous graph, highlighting the, the key evolutionary lineages that connect the most. I want to bring your attention, lastly, specifically to this uh, node here. This evolutionary lineage is the Roseman-like folds. And it is, uh, according to our preliminary results, 
the most connected evolutionary lineage. Specifically, it has one protein called ferroduxin reductase protein that contains a BAB motif that aligns across nine evolutionary lineages. So this means that one fragment here uh, has enough statistically significant alignment to correlate to nine other different evolutionary groups. And that is very, very, very significant. So what is the concluding remarks? Protein evolution is a complicated challenge. <laughs> There's a lot we don't know about proteins and a lot we don't know about how this type of polypeptides emerged. But we have some clues, especially the alpha slash beta class of proteins and the BAB motif offer a unique opportunity to study protein evolution. And through studying the structural alignment, we can reveal new structural constraints. We can reveal the underlying evolutionary relationships amongst the alpha slash beta proteins. And we can gain insight into the complexity of the alpha beta protein space. Lastly, before I end, I just want to uh, give some acknowledgments. Thank you so much to Eric Smith, who gave key insights into the beta alpha beta space and to um, my supervisor and, and, and mentor, who has been very patient with me. Uh, Liam, thank you so much. And thank you everyone at the Blue Marble Space Institute for uh, this summer internship. Oh, fantastic job, Andre. Um, you walked through that so well. Um, that was awesome. So I see we have a hand from Sanjoy. Remember, if you want to have a question, you can raise your hand or ask in the chat and I can ask for you. Uh, we'll start with Sanjoy. Andre, a really, really nice presentation. I love your visuals and how you stepped us through the process. I, I never heard of beta alpha, beta alpha beta sheets and that's uh, really, really revealing as them as the nodes. Um, I like the plot where you had the star, kind of the star shaped and you zoomed in to one, one part of it. And from there, that was a Rossman node and you're able to identify ferrodoxin reductase as like the ancestral uh, protein there. Um, what, where do the other nodes lead you to? The reason I'm asking this question is that the ferroducting reductase may suggest an iron rich environment and kind of like, what do the other nodes kind of hints do they give you? And from that perspective, can you reconstruct the environment of the origin of life? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, in reality, I haven't had time to come through all the different uh, proteins that represent these lineages because these are uh, thousands, if not like millions of comparisons that were done across the large database. So I mainly focused on the most enriched uh, node, which was the, the TM Rossman. That's why I, the, the Rossman like, sorry, uh, fold. That's why I highlighted here. But it is very interesting to think about it, right? Because ferrodoxin is like uh, a very important protein in in, in like um, um, photosynthesis organisms uh, like today, right? In photosynthesis organisms that are alive today, and we know as a fact that those were some of the first uh, metabolisms to emerge in the origin of life, right? So it is very telling that this type of protein has the most connection to evolutionary lineages. So I definitely think there's a lot of to do and, and a lot to and a lot of interesting insights to gain by exploring the connections and inside of each evolutionary lineage. But uh, for now, uh, this is all the, the insights that I can bring to the table. Thank you. Well done again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, great job, Andre. McCullen Sandora has raised his hand. McCullen? Yeah, hi. Uh, great talk. I was wondering if uh, you had any insight into how the alignment changes over time between two proteins. Like, can it be used as a molecular clock? How the alignment changes over time? I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, the TM alignment is not uh, time sensitive. It just takes uh, structures that are on the PDB and then uh, it, it compares them to one another. Um, maybe you can, uh, uh, maybe it's, there's something I'm missing on your question. Yeah, yeah. so if, if you had this uh, protein sequence and just let it evolve naturally and mutate. Um, oh, yeah, maybe. I mean, you would need to, 
I guess do some sort of, of, of wet lab analysis together with to like in order to let the protein mutate. And I assume the scores would definitely change. But uh, from a computational perspective, uh, that's not something that I uh, encountered or that I uh, would know how to, to approach. Um, but it is an interesting thought, definitely. Um, however, this was just to compare current uh, proteins on, on, current, uh, on, on our current biosphere and see you know, how they related to one another and maybe get insights from that. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. Um.